Welcome to Thrive with Asbury Seminary. I'm your host, Wes Wilcox, and my guest today is Dr. John Oswalt. Dr. Oswalt is the visiting distinguished professor of Old Testament here at Asbury Seminary. This is his third term on Asbury Seminary's faculty. He is the author of 16 books and has also written numerous articles that have appeared in Bible encyclopedias, scholarly journals, and popular religious periodicals. Dr. Oswald is an ordained minister and has served as a part-time pastor in congregations in New England and Kentucky, and he is a frequent speaker in conferences, camps, and local churches. Today we're talking about his calling and why he loves to teach. Well, Dr. Oswald, we are so glad to have you on the podcast today. Thank you. And thank you for taking your time to, to join us. Um, and before we get started, um, so you and I have a little bit of a shared history, and you've known my family for a long time. Um, and so I've gotten to know you a little bit um, through the years and working together here at the seminary. But um, just tell everybody a little bit about how we know yes. each other. Yes. In uh, 1973, uh, a pastor from the Central Methodist Church in Maysville died early in the fall. The church wanted to keep his wife in the parsonage for the rest of the year. And so the uh, district superintendent cast around and tried to find someone who would fill the pulpit for uh, the rest of that year. And he landed on me. Uh, I was very young at the time, uh, only in my third year here at the seminary, but I took on the task of driving back and forth every Sunday morning up to Maysville and coming back Sunday evening doing two services there. And uh, two of the young people that I met in the church at that time <laughs> were uh, Steve Wilcox and Marla and I've forgotten what her maiden name was, but they were not married at the time. Uh, ultimately, they did marry and produced Wesley Wilcox. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're here doing this podcast. Yes. Oh, amazing. Um, that was a great year. Uh, it was, it was a, a blessed time um, with those people and uh, several who are now gone to heaven, including your father, uh, were great friends across the years. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, it, like I said, it's, it's a lot of fun to get to now talk to you on the podcast. And you've been with Asbury Seminary off and on three different stints, um, 1970 to 82 as professor of Old Testament and Semitic languages, then 89 to 99 as professor of Old Testament. And then you returned in 2009 as visiting distinguished professor of Old Testament. So we'll get into like how you originally came here. But a question that I've had almost since I've started here and knew you worked here, what does your current title mean, Visiting <laughs> Distinguished Professor of Old Testament? Well, I like to answer students by saying, what it means is they don't pay me benefits. <laughs> uh, the seminary has the uh, policy that at age 70, a tenured professor gives up tenure and takes an annual salary at the uh, wish of the seminary and of him. And so the, the visiting uh, term is recognizing that situation, that it is an annual salary and uh, an annual commitment. Oh, OK. Because I was thinking, you've been visiting for 14 <laughs> years now. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Um, so tell me, when you first came to Wilmore and first came to Asbury Seminary, or actually, well, when you first left that first time, did you think you'd be returning two more times to Wilmore? <laughs> no, and, and when uh, we left after my seminary work here, uh, that was in 1965, Karen often says, well, as we drove out of town, I thought, that's the last time I'll see Wilmore. <laughs> 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 Her premonition was uh, dead wrong. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I left in 1982 to become president of what was then Asbury College. And uh, then when I got delivered from that by God's <laughs> grace, uh, and we went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, we were assuming that would be for the long term. But... Uh, 
Uh, after about two years at Trinity, uh, very, very lovely, lovely years, I realized I'm going to be an honored guest here. Uh, Trinity um, is owned by the Evangelical Free Church. The Evangelical Free Church has become more and more reformed over the years, and they wanted an Arminian because their roots are Arminian and they wanted to be free. But at the same time, I recognized uh, as an Arminian, I was going to be an honored guest there. And I thought, that's fine. But uh, only a few months later, uh, Dr. Joseph Wong, who was then uh, head of the uh, Biblical Studies Department here, uh, called me late one evening and said in his uh, rather conspiratorial tones, John, we need you to come back. <laughs> and putting those two together, I said, yeah, why not? Yeah. Well, so let's, if you don't mind, let's, let's back further up. Yes. And tell us your story of coming to Christ and then um, what led you into wanting to study scripture, theological education, and also being a pastor? Well, it's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in a Christian home, a farm in uh, north central Ohio, and remember at age five in a camp meeting children's program, uh, accepting Jesus as my savior. But I really, I really had no assurance of uh, my salvation. And uh, uh, when I was about 13, I felt a call into the ministry. And when I was 13, that was okay. When I was 16, it was not okay. <laughs> I, I did not want to do that. And uh, a, a lady in our church, after one administrative board meeting, when I was uh, president of the MYF and therefore on the board, I probably was arguing about something. She said to me as we went out, Johnny, I think you might make a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so as I went to college, that was it. I knew for sure I wasn't going to be a minister, and I thought, maybe I'll be a lawyer. Interesting. But I went to Taylor University, which was a wonderful choice. Uh, and there I met, really for the first time, uh, kids who were serious about their faith, and who understood it, and uh, I really began to become uh, uncomfortable with my unwillingness to do what God said. The fall of my sophomore year, uh, Dr. Dennis Kinlaw, well, he wasn't a doctor at that point, he was Reverend Dennis Kinlaw, came to do the fall spiritual emphasis week. And I remember telling a girl whom I took on a date, uh, as we went back to her dorm, boy, when I hear that guy preach, I'm not even sure I'm a Christian. Uh, the end of the week, um, it would be in fact about now, this was in early October, uh, uh, I uh, made an appointment to go talk to him. And uh, in, in a few moments, he said, John, I understand what your difficulty is. And I said, oh? He said, yes, you are on the throne of your life, and Jesus is on the periphery. And you will never be happy until Jesus is on the throne and you are on the periphery. Would you like to do that? I said, yeah. Well, in what I learned later was fairly typical of uh, Dr. Kinlaw. We were sitting on chairs, sort of knee to knee. He moved out to the edge of his chair, so his face was very close to mine. And he said, John, what is there you won't do? Mm. I just blurted it out. I won't be a preacher. He said, well, I guess that's the end of our discussion then, isn't it? And I said, no, no, I, I want him to be on the throne. John, how can he be on the throne of your life if there's something you know he wants you to do and you won't do it? Mm -hmm. Oh. So in that moment, I made the decision to say yes, and it was uh, certainly among the best decisions of my life. Uh, I remember going to the dining room just after that for lunch and sitting there looking out across the great cornfields of Indiana thinking, I don't feel any different. 
but things are going to be different. Yeah. And they were. They were in a, in a variety of ways. So uh, that was my soft, the beginning of fall of my sophomore year. In the spring of my junior year, Dr. Kinlaw came back, and uh, I was talking with him. And at that point, Taylor was becoming more and more Baptistic in term. It had been a Methodist school, uh, but most of the students at that point were from more Baptist connections. So if you were going to go to seminary, you went to Fuller or Gordon or Westminster. So I was talking with Dr. Kenlon, and he said, uh, where are you going to go to seminary? I said, well, probably Westminster or Gordon or Fuller. Again, John, you're a Methodist, aren't you? Yeah. Why would you go to a school that would destroy your heritage? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Just put that very bluntly to you. Well, at that point, I had such admiration for him. If he had said, go to the moon, I would have tried. <laughs> so I said to him, well, where do you think? And he said, Asbury Theological Seminary. So that was the end of the, the decision process. And in 1961, I came here as a student and uh, uh, have never looked back. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Um, that's very interesting about asking you you know, what won't you do? And I think that is so true. Um, I know it's been true in my life. And yes. I think when you hear a lot of people's testimonies, that's sometimes a common thread, that there's a yes. thing that we just don't want to do. Exactly. And that's the very thing exactly. that God is wanting us to do. Yes, because it's preventing us from really giving ourselves to him completely. Yeah. I've, I've told the story over and over again for years. Uh, an old farmer said to me, I never knew that two coon dogs and a shotgun were bigger than God till he asked me for them. <laughs> <laughs> so that, there it is. Yeah. So, uh, when I, uh, I, as a result of that experience at Taylor, I began to read the Bible seriously for the first time in my life and thought, well, I better start at the beginning. <laughs> so for those, the rest of my time at Taylor and my first year here at the seminary, I was working slowly through the Old Testament and just finding it opening doors and windows on my faith. And uh, then in the spring of my second year here, I felt a clear call into teaching. Now it's very interesting. When I was a senior at Taylor, I was I was an English lit minor, and uh, in after one of the classes, the professor said, uh, "John, could I speak to you a moment?" And I said, "Sure." She said, uh, "What are you planning to do?" And I said, "Oh, I'm I'm going to become a missionary." She said. I think you have a gift for teaching, hmm. and I think you ought to consider that. Wow. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> what does she know? <laughs> well, 30 years later, I was back at Taylor, and she was there, and she said, do you remember a conversation we oh, had? Wow. <laughs> I said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. But at any rate, I felt a call into teaching, and I thought, well, what will I teach? Well, I was taking Hebrew at that time and enjoying it, and... Old Testament. <laughs> huh. I'm so glad I made that decision about a month before the announcement was made. We have a new Old Testament professor coming next fall, a man named Kinlaw. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I had made the decision after he was here, I would always thought, well, I chose Old Testament because of him. Uh -huh. uh, but no, that wasn't the case. That's funny how he just kept re-entering your life. Uh, yes, yes, and yeah. I'm I'm forever grateful. Oh for yeah, him because of because yeah. of that. So um, I then he he persuaded me to stay for a year and do a THM um, as preparation for PhD, and I think it definitely was. And then went to Brandeis. My sense of call into teaching was to college teaching. Uh, 
and and in the in the graduate program, most of the uh, other evangelicals were going to seminary, but I, no, I'm going to college. So I, by God's grace, uh, got a job at Barrington College in Rhode Island, and it was it was a wonderful entry into teaching. Uh, there were uh, uh, three other relatively young men in the department, and they sort of took me under their wing and. Uh, it was, it was great. But I realized, okay, if I remain in college teaching, I probably will not do very much of a scholarly nature. And that's okay. Well, that fall, <laughs> Dr. Kinlaw left Asbury Seminary to become president of Asbury College, and I was invited to apply for the position. Well, I thought, my goodness, here I am, a brand new PhD in my first year of teaching, and I knew that some of the others who were uh, being considered had a lot more experience. And uh, but I thought, well, why not? Yeah. Let's let's test the waters. So I did, and I was one of the uh, uh, three who were interviewed. Well, one of them had about twenty years of experience and several publications. The other one was a colleague of mine, but a very bright guy with a, with a very good degree, and me. So I thought, well, not a chance, but why not? So the, the younger man, the, the fellow student of mine, was offered the position. But in the end, he turned it down and didn't turn it down until late in May. So they couldn't fill the position that fall, and it was empty. Uh, but when I got the news of who had been chosen, I wrote to Dr. Stanger and said, thank you for the opportunity to interview, and thank you for uh, these possibilities, and I think you've made the right choice. Ever after that, when I did finally come back to teach here, he would remind me of that. He said, I don't think I ever got an interviewee who was turned down who thanked me. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt at the time, it's great. Huh. So our daughter Elizabeth was born in January, a very difficult birth. A uh, hundred years earlier, I probably would have lost both Karen and Elizabeth. Uh, Karen was in bed for several weeks. Uh, and in the middle of that came the phone call from Dr. Stanger, we'd like you to take this position. It was difficult. Uh, uh, there were just a lot of factors that left it sort of hanging. Should we stay at Barrington? Should we go back to Asbury? In the end, we, Karen and I remember, uh, sitting in our bedroom, she in bed, I at the foot of the bed, just pros and cons. And her memory is different from mine. Her memory is that it was 51% to stay in Rhode Island. My memory is that it was 51% to go. <laughs> <laughs> and she was submissive. <laughs> uh, so we came. And uh, it was, again, it, it was truly a wonderful dozen years. Uh, Dr. Livingston, who was the Old Testament professor at that point, and, and had been my Old Testament professor, along with Dr. Kinlaw, was so gracious, uh, and it was, it was a good experience. Yeah. So in that time, you're a teacher and um, thinking about coming here and everything. Had that superseded, in your mind, the call to being a pastor, or were you pastoring also during this time? I was not pastoring. Okay. I, I was preaching pretty frequently. Oh, okay. And in fact, during the six months after I turned in my resignation at Barrington and we finally moved here, uh, we were financially very tightly pinched, and I was preaching virtually every weekend. Uh, so, uh, yes. I would say, and, and this is interesting, I don't think I was ever called to be a pastor. Oh, okay. I think I was called to preach. Okay, yeah, and there is a difference. <laughs> and there is yeah. a difference. The, the wonderful experience at Maysville, though, for that year, 
was I realized I could be a pastor. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a great encouragement to me because uh, the devil has his variety of accusations and uh, uh, one accusation was, well, you chose teaching because you couldn't be a pastor. Mm -hmm. that, that experience at Maysville said, no, I could have if God had called in that direction. Yeah. So, but students often say, well, you never can tell when Oswald stops teaching and starts preaching. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I have, I have all my life loved to preach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's very interesting how your calling kind of unfolded and how it started with a call to preach. We will yes. clarify yes. that. Um, and then moved to teaching. And, um, and it's clearly something that you love doing and <laughs> clearly where God had wanted you. Um, and from hearing you preach several times, the teacher in you comes out <laughs> when you preach. And uh, it's always... Um, an education hearing you preach as well as an inspiration and a conviction at the same time. Um, so I, I'm, I've been fascinated how you balance those two roles. So we're going to shift subjects just slightly, but um, outside of your teaching, preaching, do you have any hobbies that you enjoy? Do you have time for <laughs> hobbies? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm a model railroader. Really? I have a... Uh, uh, 10 by 20 foot room in the basement that is full of a, a scene. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've done that for a long time. Oh, wow. Well, that's cool. Is that something from childhood that was always an interest? Partly, or? yes. Yes. I got my first electric train for Christmas when I was 10 years old. And uh, uh, through high school, I built a lot of model airplanes. And, and did some with, with model trains. Interestingly, my, my connection to trains is connected to Asbury Seminary. <laughs> uh, uh, that first year when I was single, uh, another single student uh, subscribed to the Model Railroader magazine and uh, he showed it to me and, and that sort of re-sparked my interest. And the next summer I was a night watchman at a uh, factory and so had, after I woke up at one or two in the afternoon, uh, had the rest of the afternoon and early evening free, found a hobby shop going out of business and bought some kits and a power pack and some track, and that was the beginning. That's uh, very cool. I think that's so interesting. It's interesting to me because the hobby has such variety. There's electronics. Uh, you can build uh, building kits or car kits. There's carpentry. Uh, there's scenery work, so if you get tired of one aspect, there's another one to work with. Yeah, and it gives your brain something different to focus on from yes. the reading and the yes. Um, yes. writing and all yes. that. Those those little people on that layout obey me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yep. That's very cool. I also like to work in the yard. I'm not really a gardener, but I, I like yard work mm -hmm. and... Uh, and then reading, I, I say to people, I am an omnivorous reader. I read anything uh, from perfume bottles on up. <laughs> <laughs> so do you enjoy fiction? Uh, yes. I, at, at one point, I read, uh, like uh, J.I. Packer, uh, a lot of mysteries. Uh, now, mysteries have gotten so filthy. <laughs> to use the word, uh, that I, I find very few that I enjoy. I'm, I have most recently read a lot of military history. Really? Yeah. Civil War, First World War, Second World War, uh, read a lot of that. Is there a specific period that you're really interested in or just? Probably more the Second World War okay. because that was my childhood. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, Interesting. I always like to know what what people enjoy outside of the thing that most of us know them for, because I think that's very fascinating. Um, well, so getting back to our theological discussion, um, what do you see as the value in 
a theological education because I, I know working at the seminary and we're all a part of this, it seems obvious to us that, yeah, this really is important and very valuable. But what would you say is why it's important, particularly for those going into pastoring, preaching? Yes. Um, it is important because God has given us minds. Uh, the, the thing about, and particularly the Christian faith, is it is not so much mystical as it is rational. Uh, obviously, there is the mystical element. We believe Christ lives in us. We believe that we can have communion with him. That's mystical. But uh, Kierkegaard was wrong when he said that Christian faith is like the person who stands on the rail of a speeding ocean liner at night and jumps off believing he will be caught. No, no. God has given us evidence, and it's rational evidence. And in the Bible story, we have then this connected narrative of how God has worked in human lives and how he has represented himself through human experience. And if you are to understand all of that, you've got to think it through. Mm -hmm. And so the, the faith of Christianity is not merely rational. It's ultimately more than rational, mm -hmm. but it's never irrational. It's never flying in the face of reality. So for instance, uh, this is where C.S. Lewis makes a wonderful point with the Gospels versus the Gospel of Thomas. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus makes birds out of mud and throws them in the air and they fly away. Lewis says, no, Jesus' miracles are always within the boundaries of nature. He is always turning grape juice into wine. <laughs> he is always making bread from grain. It's just a little faster <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> than usual. So that if we are to lead people into a faith that will survive, it's got to have a rational intellectual basis. Yeah. And if you are not trained to lead people in that way, you're not going to be able to do it. Uh, I've always loved a story that a pastor told me. He said, uh, I was going to go to Asbury. And I said, oh, he said, yes, but they required Greek. So I went to another seminary that didn't require Greek. He said, now... My people ask me about something in the Bible, and I know it's got something to do with the Greek, and I don't know what it is, and it makes me mad as the devil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. There is the Word of God, and the Word of God has come to us in this intellectually, rationally connected form, and we ought to be able to help people to understand what it is saying and why it is saying that. So that the, this kind of theological training is precisely for the sake of the congregation. Right. It's not for you to have a diploma on the wall. It's for you to be able to lead them in a reliable way into a faith that can survive. Yeah. So what would you say to people, because I've heard various arguments from people saying, well, the Bible is all I need. And so if you're telling me that I have to have this theological education, then does that mean that the Bible by itself is not enough? And or that uh, for the congregation to feel like, well, you're telling me all these things, does that mean that I can't even read it unless I understand all of this. What, what can you say to that sort uh, of thing? This is part of, of what we were just saying. The Bible has come to us 
as a piece of rational intellectual literature. If you're going to understand a piece of literature, you've got to understand, number one, its historical setting. Yeah. Number two, you've got to understand its literary setting. What kind of literature is this? Uh, is this uh, a judicial argument? Is it a story? Is it a parable? If you are to understand it, you've got to know something about it. I've often said, suppose you are walking down the street and you find a piece of paper on the sidewalk and you pick it up and you immediately decide, oh, this is a letter. How do you know that? <laughs> By the form. <laughs> it's got a salutation, a greeting. It's got a closing. But who are these people? Well, you don't know them. So the letter doesn't make a lot of sense to you because you don't know what their situation was, what they were writing from, what they were writing about. Uh, but suppose, on the other hand, that you're in the attic of your parents' house and you find a letter. And you realize from the name, it's a letter that your grandfather wrote to your grandmother before they were married when he was a soldier in the Civil War. You're gonna understand that letter in ways that you could never understand the other letter. Yeah. And that's what the Bible is. The Bible is God's love letter to us and if you're going to understand it, then you've got to understand what the context was. But this is even more true of the Bible as it is because the Bible is unusual. Other holy books, by and large, are simply statements, supposedly from the God to people. Mahatma Gandhi is reported to have said to E. Stanley Jones, well, the Bible can't be a holy book. It's got all these stories in it. Yes, God chose to reveal himself to a particular people in a particular place in a particular time. I'm confident he did that precisely because he wanted to make the ultimate truth intelligible because we see it in the context of real life. But you've got to know what that real life is yeah. so that, yes, the Bible, quote, is enough, <laughs> but you've got to understand its context, historical context, literary context, its setting, if you're to get what it really says. Yeah. And that means not only uh, context, it also means language. I mentioned the Greek thing. Uh, I spent a good portion of my life working in Bible translation, and one of the things that was reinforced for me is any translation is an approximation. You are attempting to say as clearly as you can what that says, but languages are never one for one. Yeah. This concept is expressed in six words in this language, <laughs> where it was expressed in one word there. And again, uh, the great joy of being a uh, preacher or a pastor is being able to say, here's what's going on here. Here's why these three translations differ yeah. <laughs> on this passage. What's going on is in the Greek or in the Hebrew. Again, this is a gift that you are giving to your people to enable them to understand better. Yeah. And even within that, there is a gift in how you give that to your people. And um, as I said from hearing you preach on multiple occasions, you very much have a gift for that balance. And um, is that something you consciously think about when you're crafting a message that you know you want to teach people but you don't want to lose them in the minutia of all the Greek or the Hebrew yes, yes. and yes. how how do you is that just a process over time that you figure well out it, it is some of that it is it is 
trial and error, what works and what doesn't work. Uh, when you see their eyes glassy, yeah. <laughs> you know, oops, <laughs> this isn't working. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it is also very intentional. Um, I, I try to say to students, there's a very significant difference between a Bible lecture and a sermon. Mm -hmm. A Bible lecture, you are simply trying to inform. A Bible sermon, you are seeking to address. Mm -hmm. You are seeking to speak to the person in their situation and enable them to appropriate this material for their lives. That means you've got to do some things differently. Uh, uh, and, and, and I have said to people, a sermon has to be simple. That is, there has to be a point, and the people have to understand what that point is. Mm -hmm. Ideally, when they go out the door, somebody says, what was the sermon about? They can say, it was about this. Oh. It's also got to be clear in the sense that more so than, say, a lecture where hopefully they're taking notes, uh, but, but the sermon, it's got to be clear how you get from this to this to this to that. And, and that articulation is very, very important. Uh, it's also got to be artistic. Yes. There's got to be something about it that has a certain beauty that captures people. Mm -hmm. And so how that artistry is expressed is going to be different from person to person. But it can't be just a bunch of unrelated ideas. There's got to be coherence yeah. as, a, as a work of art has coherence. Yeah, and it really is. I mean, you talk about artistry and um, people who are good at preaching, such as yourself. There is definitely an art to that because um, your ability to draw people in and you get very invested and you want to know when you bring in more of the teaching aspects, it is interesting. Whereas you can go the other way and it yes, becomes you can. Yes, you like, can. okay, when are we going to get to a point? So what? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, this has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank um, you. We have one final question that we ask all of our guests. So this podcast is called the Thrive with Asbury Seminary podcast. So what is something in your life right now that is helping you thrive, whether it's spiritual, maybe it's your hobbies, but what's something that's helping you thrive? The opportunity to teach. Really? Uh, uh, I, I recently have been reading... Um, uh, a collection of, of Peggy Noonan's essays. And uh, in one of them, she says, I write because I have the feeling I was made for this. Mm. That's why I teach. <laughs> That's great. That, that was a great thing to be able to say. Dr. Kinlaw said once when I was a student, well, if they wouldn't pay me to teach, I'd have to pay them to let me teach. <laughs> and I thought at the time, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I think I understand now. Wow. Uh, um, and people say, why do you teach? And I say, for the joy of watching the light come on behind their eyes. Mm. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, so I have an opportunity to, this, of course, is summer, so the classes are over, but... Uh, uh, I, I, I taught uh, an exegesis of Isaiah course in the spring, and it was just a delight. Uh, uh, I, had, I had the feeling that students were connecting and uh, that, that the book was being opened to them in ways that hadn't been before. And I also had the opportunity to teach a Sunday school class at the uh, local Free Methodist Church and uh, uh, it's fun. That's great. It's a, it's a good thing to know you're right in the place that God wants you to be doing the thing that gives you life. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you again very much. It's been great having you on thank today. Thank you. You're welcome.